lectures to be followed by a series of question and answers. The Mumbai branch of the Institute of Marine Engineers India is indeed indebted to the Director General of Shipping for partnering with us for the last many years, or shall I say many decades, to enable a technical meeting after each MEPC session. We especially thank the Chief Surveyor, Mr. S. Barik, for having kindly agreed to inaugurate this session and deliver the opening address. I shall now hand over proceedings back to Mr. S. M. Rai, the compare for the evening to take things forward. And I, lastly, I wish all the 450 participants who have registered for this webinar good deliberations. And I'm sure that you will find this session interesting and informative. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Mr. Rai, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jain. Before I take further, I would like to thank you also the role you are playing as chairman of the Mumbai branch in motivating the members to keep the activities going in the full flow. So thank you for all your support. Arrangement. Uh, I would now request our chief guest of the evening. I'm proud to say that today's chief guest is one of us. He's a marine engineer, a chief surveyor to the government of India, Sri Shyam Bari. He's a graduate mechanical engineer and took over as Chief Surveyor to Government of India, come additional secretary in uh, September of 2019. It is always a privilege, as I said earlier, the directorate associates with us in briefing the stakeholders in the industry after every MEPC meeting to let the industry and the stakeholders know that what is in store and what is coming forward in the coming years. So I would request uh, Sri Barik Sir, please inaugurate the today's uh, uh, webinar with a few words from you. Shri, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you're yes, audible. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you, thank you. Sir, yes. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, one and all. And good, good afternoon to one and all. It is my privilege to inaugurate this seminar and to introduce the outcome of the MEPC 75. As you all know that IMEI Mumbai branch has been there is some problem, internet problem. Is it continuous or it's breaking? No, it's okay, sir. Continue. Please go ahead. Your audio is okay, sir. Okay, I'm uh, putting up the video. I think uh, it is some pop up is coming. Your internet is unstable, sir. If you put off your video, we'll get little more bandwidth, and then I hope that. Uh, but but so far so good, sir. Okay, I put up my video. So as you all know that IMEI Mumbai branch has been organizing seminars on the outcome of MEPC meetings every year. But this is the first time on a virtual platform being conducted due to COVID. I appreciate and congratulate IMEI Mumbai branch for this. <coughs> These seminars have proved very informative to the stakeholders to keep them apprised and aware of what is being discussed at IMO and what is likely to emerge on the shipping environmental front in the coming years. Dear friends, senior colleagues, and dear colleagues, global warming and environmental issues have taken center stage during the last few years. And it is encouraging that shipping is not slow in taking measures to tackle this global warming mm -hmm and environmental degradations. As a matter of fact, shipping remains the most organized and regulated sector in, in efforts to protect the environment because of its global nature. Even though shipping is one of the lowest carbon emitter in terms of per ton miles of cargo carried, <laughs> What is going to impact the climate change is the total emissions from the sector. 
no matter whatever we do to reduce emission it will not be enough till such time we develop zero emissions technology with no pollutants emitted to the atmosphere imo's fourth ghg study highlights that ghg emission from shipping is projected to increase by up to 50% above 2018 levels by 2050 The study shows that total greenhouse gas emissions from maritime shipping rose about 10% from 2012 to 2018. <clears throat> Indian government and the administration are alert and sincere in its approach to ensure all practical measures are taken with a due consideration to the fact that trade is not unduly impacted and remains competitive. The MEPC 75 was initially scheduled to be held between 30th March and 3rd April, but due to COVID-19 pandemic, it got postponed to 16th November to 20th November. Due to this change and rest restricted time, many agenda items got either curtailed or got postponed to MEPC 76. The core group at DGS. consisting of dgs mmd officials and representatives of the industry and stakeholders had held several meetings as always to finalize views and stand of india to be presented at mepc 75 thanks to all of them there is a panel of experts to bring forth the details of discussions and decisions at mepc 75 to you today and let me just touch upon the outcome on some of the important issues some of the decisions which has been taken in mepc 75 are it has adopted amendments to regulations 1 2 14 18 20 21 and appendices 1 and 6 of marcol and x6 these are some definitions regarding sulfur content low flask point fuel marcol delivered samples in use sample on board sample i think uh, Mr. Kashyap is going to elaborate on this uh, adoption. It has also adopted amendments to timelines and reduction factors for different ship types and ship sizes for EEDI Phase Three requirement. It has approved the amendments to Marcol and X6 to reduce carbon intensity of existing ships. MEPC also considered an industry proposal for establishment of a research and development fund and administering organization but issues surrounding a mandatory levy and the government and the governance and structure of the autonomous organization short day long debate with most member states rejecting proposal of raising mandatory fund through marcol convention while many raised various concerns with such proposal and very few supported the proposal most member states agreed with the establishment of imrb for coordinating research activities in zero carbon fuels and propulsion systems for early introduction since no conclusions could be arrived after a lot of discussion the committee decided to invite interested parties to comment on this and related proposals through submission to mepc 76 the detail of detail regarding this imrb and the interven interventions made by india on this will be told by my colleague mr sukumaran the committee has approved ban on use and carriage of hfo in arctic waters the committee approved the draft amendments to afs convention for adoption in mepc 76 and it has adopted amendments to regulation e1 of the ballast water management convention and the form of international ballast water management certificate now let me tell what needs to be done by dgs on the outcome of this mepc 75 it has to take into consideration the amendments to regulation 14 of marcol annex 6 and required to issue a circular to make the requirements clear with respect to changes in ipp certificate format fitment of 
in new sampling points plan approval sulfur testing by approved bunker suppliers in india list of laboratories in india eligible for testing as per the amendments needs to be drawn out in case fuel oil sampling and testing is required under tsc procedure for sampling by tsc inspector also needs to be drawn out the directorate has to issue instruction to ro to ensure that required and attain eedi is informed to it for submission to imo the commissioning test has been implemented by directorate directorate by the dg circular 32 of 2020 however an addendum need to be issued regarding issuance of review revised statement of compliance for ballast water management convention indicating the conduct of commissioning test and it has to prepare a paper on the impact of a levy on fuel oil for setting up a imrb to be submitted to mep mepc 76 with all of your cooperation and industry participation and we should must try to take support of as many members as possible and uh, prepare discuss with the stakeholders and submit national action plan to imo happy to know that all indian delegates to mepc 75 are attending this um, this seminar i thank all of them including all those who are contributing constantly from behind the scene for their constant support and cooperation i am sure they will contribute for the success of this seminar all the panelists are seniors and season and will apprise participants about the issues deliberated during this online meeting of mepc 75 i wish you all the best for a lively and fruitful discussions and deliberation and thank you all thank you sir sorry sir thank you sir for your briefing and uh, particularly i would like to thank you for the support and confidence that you have reposed or the director has reposed in the institute of marine engineers and would like to place on record our appreciation of uh, conducting this core committee meeting in the directorate at regular interval before proceeding for mepc meetings in london i am also thankful to you for including a representative of institute of marine engineers among that delegate members so my special thanks to you and we continue to look forward to the support of you and other officers of the directorate now as you mentioned today we have very seasoned senior panelists among us today who have been representing india for years now at the imo uh, to start with i will call our lead panelist and a senior official of the director general of shipping shri ajit kumar sukumaran to be the first to outline challenges on environmental issues in shipping and speak on international maritime research and development board and the fund shri sukumaran is a mechanical engineer graduate did his post graduation maritime operation management from iit kharagpur he is with the dgs for 17 years currently he is working as po chennai and come join director general of technical in shipping i had the pleasure of attending few imo sessions with him and we look forward to his enlightening us i would request uh, sukumar sir if you can give a brief about the overall situation or environmental requirement on the shipping because this issue is uh, going on for almost four decades now and every time some amendments keep coming so while amendments and details will be taken up by the other panelists i will specifically request you to just give us a brief scenario about shipping and environmental issues and about the research and development board and the fund because well, that is created a lot of ripples and some opposition particularly about the news that uh, bunker would be subjected to a special levy for this fund it will hurt the ship owners so i would like to hear from you that what transpired at mepc sir all yours sir welcome thank you rai sir uh, thank you barik sir and uh, good evening to all one and all and the uh, group in fact uh, i must uh, thank first the ime for coming up with such a uh, wonderful platform to share the happenings of what of mepc for i think for the last 10 years at least 
it is indeed my honor to be part of indian delegations pemi for the last 10 years in various committees even just before the mepc i was leading the maritime safety committee meeting just one week before that but mepc has got a special place in my mind why because first of all the the kind of technical expertise the committee has got the kind of depth of deliberations which it takes place and above all its impact on the international shipping not from the environmental point of view alone from the technical point of view from the commercial point of view and even from the social point of view mind you out of the 53 conventions imo has more than 21 are related with the environment stressing the importance of maritime i mean mepc so this year also the 75th mepc as usual had been very active so the general discussion which has happened uh, uh, barik sahab has already explained and who will be dealing with but i think rai sahab has already given me the task of uh, imrb one of the most uh, discussed topic or perhaps one of the most controversial topic today and i think it is going to be so for the, at least for uh, several mepcs in future as well because my experience or our experience is that once uh, a decision has been taken from some group it will come through that is what the fact uh, mepc despite of all its democratic nature now before explaining what is aim imrb and what are the positions which india had taken at imo and the reason behind that i think as rai sahab had mentioned i must just give a brief background i am not going to give a complete uh, pollution background of uh, shipping but on the ghg background and how the india's position is being arrived at why because uh, the maritime sector for any country cannot have a separate policy particularly to deal with uh, greenhouse gas emission and climate change issues so in india also our policies particularly what i mean is that the maritime policies has to be in line with the policies of the central government or government of india so there are certain fundamental basis on which the policies of the government of india has been evolved in all international climate change negotiations first our position has been well clear that today's mess of uh, the issues created by the greenhouse gas is not the creation of developing countries like india but decades and perhaps centuries of over exploitation and over industrialization by the developed nations that is why the united nations framework convention on the climate change that is un of triple c the paramount committee which decides the climate change negotiations through its kyoto protocol has identified annex 1 and annex 2 countries annex 1 countries are largely developed countries and annex 2 is largely developing countries including india and there is no mandatory uh, limit a quantified mandatory limit of emission for annex 2 countries on the other hand there is a mandatory quantified limit for the de- annex 1 countries that is why the popular term of the cbdrrc common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities came into force itself so that means there is a common responsibility for the entire maritime nations but there is a difference in that uh, responsibilities in effect the developed countries has to have more responsibilities and more larger ambitious contributions towards the limiting environment i mean the climate change i mean uh, greenhouse gas or other emissions that is one point number two is that see the if you are seeing the 2007 figures or the latest uh, one figures if you are seeing the annual emission from india happens to be a uh, greenhouse gas emission happens to be around 1331 million tons of uh, co2 equivalent that means uh, it's around 4% of the global emission and see that depending upon our pollution i mean population the 4% how low it could be 
But the other thing is that our position is well established that the per capita emission, the per capita emission of the 2010 of the world is 4.22 ton. On the other hand, the India says that our per capita emission will not be more than four tons even in 2030. That means even after two decades, I mean, one decade from here, two decades from the earliest and our per capita emission will be lower than the world standard, I mean, world average, and more so, it will always be, our voluntary commitment is that our per capita emission will be always lower than the developed nations. In effect, if the developed our counterparts he is putting up ambitious projects, ambitious proposals for reduction of uh, emission. Naturally, it will put a cap on developing countries like India, and we will abide by that. But the fact that we also have the millions of the billions of people living, and they also need to have a better standard of living. Once uh, one sector of uh, uh, countries have achieved a better standard of living, then uniformly implementing such limit and strangulating the development activities of developing nations is not at all acceptable for India, countries like India. That has been the position and that is the background of greenhouse gas emission strategies of India. With this, I will go to the IMRB, which is the uh, uh, topic today. I will share my... Hope it's clear, you can see. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. See, IMRB is an international maritime research board, or a, more specifically, international maritime greenhouse gas research and development board. It is popularly called IMRB. This has been there in IMO strategies itself, and there is no doubt that IMRB is a need of the hour and nobody questions, no member has said has questioned the relevance and the need of IMRB. IMRB is supposed to be uh, operating under the uh, IMO's supervision. But the second proposal is that the IMRF, that means Inter uh, International Maritime Research and Development Fund. So how is it going to work? If you're seeing it is ultimately, it has to come from the shipping companies. Shipping companies, per ton of fuel they consume, they have to, as of now, they have said it is $2, which can be increased or decreased by IMR of board. And it has to be contributed to the general fund of IMO research fund. The flag state will be monitoring it and also through port state control. So there is a, a complete monitoring mechanism in place also, and the responsibility for collecting this money or the based on the whatever the levy which we is going to be collecting will be on the shipping companies, and it has to be given to the international research fund. Now, what are the Indian positions, and why it is it? I will be dealing with the next few slides. India's position one. India recognizes the urgent need for more proactive measures from the international community in general and from the IMO in particular in research and development on all matters pertaining to emission control to achieve the 2050 goal of the IMO's emission strategy, but not limited to alternate fuels alone. Because the current proposal of IMRF largely deals with alternate fuels, it is not dealing specifically the other areas of climate change or the GHG emission issues. Now, just see the uh, uh, latest fourth uh, GHG, <coughs> fourth GHG report from IMO. If you're seeing, you can see that the fourth GHG study presented by MEPC in uh, IMO in MEPC 75, perhaps the most authentic document in this sector, international shipping is estimated to have emitted 1056 million tons or about 2.89% uh, of the global emissions of CO2 in 2018, a marginal increase from 2.76 in 2012. 
This report has been seen in different perspective. The countries like India and many others feel that the reports have several positive uh, uh, signals, and uh, we believe that the the measures initiated by IMO, uh, particularly the technical and operational measures, including EDI and the SIEM, has been uh, productive and giving results. So, but on the other hand, there is a big lobby. Uh, led by few of the lead nations and a large number of climate, uh, I mean, organizations, which believe that uh, the report is alarming and immediate measures have to be undertaken to reduce uh, even as a short term measure to curtail the emission. Otherwise, IMO target is not going to be met. But the fact remains that the international shipping contributes only 2.89% of the global emissions of CO2, even after carrying 90%, more than 90% of the cargo. So that is the background of India's position number two. The concern and responsibilities towards climate change and reduction of VHG emissions in general, and the efforts for cleaner fuels in particular are global issues and need to be addressed collectively and not by shipping alone. In an already strained business environment created by COVID pandemic, this kind of mandatory contributions exclusively imposed on shipping, we are afraid would deny the shipping industry a level playing ground and may make it less competitive compared to other transport sectors, which are currently not subjected to any such mandatory contributions. Gentlemen, as uh, Raizab was telling, the environmental credentials of shipping is unmatched. Perhaps we are the only transport industry which has got mandatory provisions for energy efficiency control. Similarly, several other measures as such we have taken as landmark steps, which no other country, I mean, no other sector can match. That is why before coming up with more and more regulations, we have to be cautious that industry is sustained at all. So we already have the Green Climate Fund, a unique global platform established by 194 governments to respond to climate change. And there are several other governments and fund managers already providing funds to promising technologies for development of zero carbon fuels. Hence, this delegation feels that it should be the first priority of the organization to endeavor that maritime sector receives its deserving share from such already available funds prior embarking upon a new standalone fund for maritime sector that to, to deal with a universal social issue. Gentlemen, as I earlier mentioned, greenhouse gas issue is a global issue and it's a global social issue, not a shipping issue alone. And when we are considering we have to think that it's in a holistic manner. The central fund of greenhouse fund is a huge phenomenal fund. And it is our right to have as a performing industry or performing sector of the transport industry, we have the right to have adequate share from that fund. And that should be our priority before having something of our own and on the research and development fund. Now, when we see the Indian maritime sector, just see, as per 2007, India's GHG National Inventory of, by Ministry of Environment and Forest, the maritime sector's contribution is only 1.431 million tons of CO2 equivalent, which is approximately 1% of transport emissions and 0.08% of the total national emissions. Get in mind the transport emission, the major emission in India comes from the energy sector. Uh, Transport sector, in fact, contributes only around less than 9%, precisely around 8.7%. And out of that, only 1% is by shipping. That means it is much, much less than what is uh, contribution from other, country, other sectors. So you just see the biannual, second biannual update of the United uh, uh, UNFCCC by Government of India. That is in uh, 2018. Just see, two like 80s. Uh, 2,607 million tons uh, is the total. On the other hand, in the foreign section, it is only 1,266 million tons. That means less than 0.0202 percentage only. 
So in a such a scenario, that is what the background of India's position number three, it is essential for the committee to take note of the concerns of a larger sector of the shipping industry that the raising tide of new environmental rules and regulations in shipping in the current scenario may prove to be detrimental to the industry, which is yet to recuperate from an unprecedented financial glut, which we currently facing. The proposal to introduce emission control standards on ships beyond a certain level put additional cost burden on the very mode of transport, which is already the most fuel efficient. Therefore, there is an urgent need for pragmatism and amid dire economic circumstances to avoid a very real danger of creating a barrier to future investment in shipping. <clears throat> now, just see how the font is going to be there. Just, it is an international maritime research fund and from where it will come? It will come from the shipping companies, that means ships. Each ship has to contribute to the fund based on the fuel it consumes. Now, it is, it is considered to be around of $2 per ton as of now. And uh, it will be, uh, it is considered that around 250 million tons per year is traded in bunker sector. That means around the $500 million per year. And in a project considered to be for 10 years, it is a 5 billion proposal, which is not a small money. Now coming to how it is going to be administered. Administered IMRF, definitely it is going to be a separate body out of the IMO with the IMO having only supervisory role. It will be governed by a board of directors, but, and it will be decided by a chairman. And chairman will be nominating the members, but the question is who will nominate the chairman or who will select the chairman, it is left to the secretary general. And the chairman will, members of 11, the envelope, and this member, the board is going to decide the distribution of this $5 billion itself. The India's concerns going by the IOPC, I mean the uh, 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 several other funds like IOPC, is that whether, how they are going to decide on the representation in the board, how this amount is going to be distributed, equitably, particularly to the developing nations, and how much control or how much uh, the say a developing nation like India will have in such a fund, even though we are going to be one of the largest contributor because we are going to be one of the largest importer of the oil and thereby going to be one of the largest uh, uh, contributor for the CES as well. Now, IMO will be having only the general overall supervisory role. So there is another question whether the, and the IMO has a mandate for that, because IMO is asking the administrations that the government bodies to generate fund and ensure that it is a mandatory fund and monitored one and transfer it into a non-governmental organization. Whether such a mandate itself is legally to be scrutinized, that was the general opinion there in IMO. Now, that is what the background of India's position number four, we also have the concerns on the quantum of the fund that is proposed to be raised. To ensure its equitable distribution among less developed nations, the proposed and the proposed administrative framework of the IMRF itself. <clears throat> then India's position number five, we also doubt even the commercial viability and long-term sustainability of the proposal, because we believe that at the heart of success of the proposal is first to pull up the best professional around the world working on related cutting edge technologies and then to market the technologies so developed to the deserving end users. Both require extensive networking and we doubt whether a rather new establishment like IMRB will be able to compete with its counterparts like venture capital funds and other corporate establishments who have decades of experience and expertise in the field. In effect, the research and development today is to be market driven for an industry like a shipping. It is not like a charity organization. Now, <clears throat> how is the monitoring going to work? Monitoring, the, the IM, there will be an IMR of account for each ship and to which the ISM manager will be collecting the money and remitting it. How? Even from the charters who are supplying the 
fuel. They have to collect a levy of this two dollars, and I, as a manager, will be or the owner will be remitting that amount into the IMRF account, and the monitoring will be by the flag stage, by the data collection system DCS, which is already implemented as a mandatory regulation from the DCS. They will be verifying whether sufficient uh, uh, the levy has been remitted to the account, and then they will be issuing an IMR of Indian Mar uh, <coughs> International Maritime Research Certificate, and the IMR of will be issuing an annual statement, and both these will be verified by the PSC for the ship. So this is what the way in which the monitoring mechanism is going to work. But there also we have concerns. We are also afraid. That the mandatory nature of contributions, identifying responsibility for the same on the ISM manager would make the concept of third-party ship management more complex and challenging. And the responsibility on the flag states to ensure compliance through one more certification would only increase their administrative burden without any commensurate benefit to them. <coughs> Finally, gentlemen, the, the concept of market-based measures. IMO has got a three stage. One is the technical measures, then there is operational measures, and the proposed one is the market-based measures. It is nothing but as the, the output of the several organizations, particularly from the developed nations who consider shipping as a cash cow. Many developed nations are aggressively pursuing market-based measures, arguing that the providing a fiscal incentive for the maritime industry will encourage more investment in fuel efficient ships. That means the technology is already with them and they want to cash on that. So <clears throat> when we see in the particular case, IMRB proposes IMO to share the data from the data collection system based on which IMRB will decide on the quantum of mandatory contributions from each, to, each ship towards IMRF. But this is against the fundamental understanding among member states that data collection system, data collected through DCS would be used only for DIG analysis and not for any commercial purposes. That means IMR is nothing but a market-based measure which the committee has already kept in abeyance. So in the opposition number eight, we would appeal to the committee not to reopen the discussion on the topic of market-based measures, which has been consciously kept in abeyance due to strong reservations expressed by several member states that it is likely to bridge their already committed national obligations under various WTO instruments in the area, the general agreement on tariff and trade 1994 in existence among various member states. Further, India believes that the introduction of market-based measures without ensuring a level ground would distort the international shipping market against the shipping industry of developing nations, which are yet to be equipped with the novel and emerging technologies for the implementation of current environment regulations from IMO itself. India therefore reiterates its position that any further regulatory interventions from IMO, including MBM, can be undertaken only after a detailed study on the impact of the existing technical and operational measures on the maritime sector of developing nations and underdeveloped countries. <coughs> India's final position See, with the specific reference to the concern expressed by a few esteemed members regarding equitable distribution of benefits of fund to SIDs and LDCs, fund, fundamentally, if the fund is created, how it is going to be distributed? If it is to be merited, it will go only maybe one side or it may be in a distorted way. So we would like to draw the attention of the committee to Regulation 23 of Charter 4 of MARPOL Annex 6 and Resolution MAPC 22965 adopted by the committee after extensive deliberations, whereby the committee had recognized and acknowledged the financial, technological, and capacity building support essentially required by developing nation to effectively address the climate change issues. We believe the resolution stands hold in the case of IMRF also, if it is finally materialized. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, the climate change negotiations are taking place against a backdrop of an increasingly globalized and independent world economy. Development must therefore remain at the center of the global discourse and should not impose conditionalities or additional burdens on the developing countries. It must not sharpen the division of the world between an affluent north 
and impoverished south and justify this with a green label gentlemen as our former prime minister mentioned our people have the right to economic and social development but they also want clean water to drink fresh air to breathe green air to walk and clean ocean to trade thank you very much mr sukumaran thank you so much for dealing at length an issue which has been bothering the stakeholders in the industry because of the likely imposition of a taxation on the bunkers and nearly a fund of over 5 billion dollars would have taxed the industry greatly with adverse impact as uh, we discussed earlier and i am happy that the indian delegation took it up in the right manner and very forcefully at mepc that uh, this ghg emission by shipping is below 3% and to burden the shipping alone would not be fair so i am really thankful to the delegation this time and to you in particular for taking up in such strong measures at mepc so thank you so much for your submission today sir our next uh, presenter today as a panelist will be again one of our seasoned and a regular member of indian delegation to imo sri ayan bose who is a 1971 dmt pass out and uh, he worked with irs till 2007 and currently he is advisor to gasco and uh, he has represents insa in uh, mepc meetings and uh, has the privilege of authoring even two books on energy efficiency which i must say is a credit to him mr bose my request to you would be to keep to the time schedule because i say find we are actually overrunning our allotted period already per panelist but i learned that gg emission from ships in the form exi and cai were approved by mec mepc this time and some new rules have also been introduced for edi can you explain them in brief just keeping an eye on your watch as well so mr bose pardon me by rushing you through but i am sure that you will be able to project the deliberations at mepc this time mr bose thank please. you <laughs> thank you thank you uh, mr ran uh, uh, good morning uh, good afternoon good evening to everybody uh it's uh, first of all i like to thank institute of marine engineers for uh, once again organizing this particular uh, seminar or webinar now uh, highlighting the outcome of mapc uh, this particular can everybody see this uh, slide i have put up yes sir yes sir yes, sir. yes, sir. yes, sir. yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank yes, you. Sir. This yes, was sir. a very yes. unique, unique experience. I mean, doing online. This is the first time MEPC had online meeting, and it was timed uh, from London, eleven o'clock to two o'clock in the afternoon, which was not too late in Eastern Hemisphere and very not too early in Western Hemisphere. And meeting was supposed to be finished in about three hours. That was the council directive, but almost every day. it went on for 4 4 and a half hours and on the last day it went on for 6 and a half hours when we finished at 10:30 in the night it was 2 o'clock in the morning in tokyo and new zealand even beyond there that time so it was uh, quite uh, different but it is not that on the five days we took all the decisions there has been two informal meetings hosted by iimo over 5 5 days period and apart from that we use this ms teams and these kind of platforms to deliberate among uh, like minded countries which has never happened before we used to do it through correspondence but this time we could see everybody and it was much more useful and so it helped us in coming to the conclusion within 5 days of limited working hours so just moving on so what was approved was uh, uh, technical efficiency of ships existing ships the rules related to even existing ships has to meet certain standards that was agreed so i will take you through that it is called eexi energy efficiency existing ship index and ships operationally have to achieve certain CO2 intensity level. 
even that was fixed. I mean, in the shipping industry, we know that there are uh, terminologies like energy efficiency operational index, which is grams of CO2 emitted per ton mile of cargo carried. So nevertheless, this has to be now regulated and brought down step by step. And a particular regulation was adopted for, uh, uh, for advancing energy efficiency design index of new ships by a few years. So I will take you through that. So with respect to energy efficiency existing ship index, uh, just to give you a background that all ships, I mean, mo most of you are aware of this, some may not be aware that they have to re, all new ships has to achieve certain minimum energy efficiency standard. That energy efficiency standard is determined by grams of CO2 emitted per dead weight nautical mile. So on the Y axis, you have the dead weight of the vessel. And on the X axis, you have grams of CO2 per ton nautical mile. So this particular uh, element, it index uses, it's the design feature of the ship. It uses the main engine maximum continuous rating, specific fuel oil consumption of engine. On the numerator, on the denominator, it has got dead weight of the vessel and its reference speed. Reference speed is that speed which is achieved by a ship in good weather condition using 75% of main engine power being loaded up to summer load line draft. And this is established during model test and verified during sea trial for all new buildings. It is happening since 2013. So for vessels which have been built during 2013 to 2015, they had to meet phase zero. Phase zero was a starting point. That was a reference line, red colored. And the rule is saying that all ships which are being built between 2015 and 2019 end, they have to be 10% more fuel efficient. That's the EDI phase one. And ships being built between 20 and 2025 have to be 20% more efficient, phase two, and ships being built 25 onwards to be 30% more efficient. Now there are uh, work is going on to have phase four, even more, uh, I mean, even where zero carbon fuels will be considered. So this is the scenario. So now this EXI regulation is saying from 2023, existing ship has to comply with the standard required of a vessel new building in 2023. In 2023, certain ship types like tankers and bulk carriers, they will be in phase two. That means existing ships has to match the standard. Grams of CO2 per dead weight nautical mile. And gas carrier container ship, they have to meet phase three, which is 30% more fuel efficient. So how do you do it? It's possible that you can change a ship to LNG and then reduce you to emission, but it's commercially is not viable to do it on existing ships. You can fit energy saving devices to improve propulsion efficiency, fit flattener rotors or sail, or improve propeller, but this will give you a limited number of percentage of improvement, maybe 5%, 7%, but no more. What you are required to achieve is 40% intensity improvement from 2008 baseline. That's the rule is saying 2008, whatever it was, you should be down 40% by 2030. So the only technology now available is reduce the main engine power, limit the main engine power so that the speed come down and you use this limited power, dead weight and the reduced speed you will get a reduced EEDI value, which should be equal to phase two or phase three requirement. So it's, it, that is what will happen from now onwards. So supposing all engines have used maximum of 75 MCR, 
The remaining is C margin. It is to overcome the rough sea condition, etc. There are also that's about 15%, and there is an engine margin of 10%. That engine deteriorates over time, so you keep that particular margin. Now that MCR will be brought down to somewhere here, which has to be found out by calculation, that at what limited power, main engine power, and limited, uh, consequently limited speed, will I get that EDI value? And the balance will be reserve power. So what will happen is that on a mechanical engine, the calculation has to be done, that at what power it has to be limited, then you develop that power during a sea trial, have the governor maker on board, have the main engine service engineer on board, and have the class surveyor on board. So once it develops that power and governor maker knows at what point he has to lock the fuel lever so that the power doesn't take, exceed that much. So it will be locked at that particular position and it cannot exceed that power. The res remaining becomes safety power. So for example, a Cape size vessel, it's full MCR, maybe 18,000 kilowatt. And the calculation may show that to achieve EDI phase two, you have to reduce the power to 12,000 kilowatt. So when you reserve 2,000 kilowatt, but there is a caveat in the rule that if the ship faces bad weather condition, going through piracy prone waters, then master has the right to remove that seal and take out that lock. He gets full access to 18,000 kilowatt, but he has to log it down in the log book, not log book, it's a record book, a power limitation record book, inform flag state, inform next port of call. And then once that exigency is over, you have to revert back to that power limitation, put the seal back, put it down in your official log book, inform flag state, inform next port of call. So this is the only way you can achieve that. And this rule was particularly approved. So here you can see the initially of a ship. I have explained this through a Cape size example. So I don't take you to this, I just skip it. So all existing ships are to meet EDI phase two or phase three requirement that will be able to new ship. Why I am saying is phase two, phase three is that certain ship type it is phase two and for certain ship types, it is phase three. I will show you which, which are the ship types which has to meet phase three. EDI calculation, EXI calculation has to be reflected in EXI technical file. For individual ships, compliance has to be verified at the first annual intermediate or renewal international air pollution prevention survey falling due after entry into force of the regulation which will happen in 2023. Uh, that means in one year, 2023, almost 33,000 ships have to achieve compliance. New international energy efficiency certificate with supplement will be issued showing what is the required EXI value of that ship, what is the attained EXI value of the ship, and the fact that the vessel has a verified EXI technical file. For EDI compliant vessels, EDI technical file will serve the purpose of EXI technical file. EXI is EEDI, same formula, different calculation guideline in recognition of the fact that all data may not be available on existing ships. It's most unlikely that you will find in a 1997 or 2000 built ship to have a speed power curve with scantling drafts. Some of the better shipyards had it, but most didn't have it. You will have it in operational draft. And in some ship, it just may be missing. It's a secondhand acquisition. So for that in the guideline, they have given up empirical formula to, calculate, to derive the speed power curve for a ship of that dead weight of that ship time. So that is how it has to be included. So uh, currently a draft guideline exists, but the detailed guideline will be developed from now until June next year through correspondence, and it will be approved by next MEPC in June 2021. Okay, moving on. So these are the reduction factor. Bulk carriers generally 20 to 20, 200,000 deadweight tonnage, 20% they have to 
reduce EDI phase two. For gas carrier, larger gas carrier, it is phase three. And for the smaller one, it's phase two. For tankers, phase two. Container ships, phase three. Largest ones, 50% reduction. Because it is those ships were originally designed for very high speeds. They don't need that kind of speed. So the power is being reduced so that the emission intensity comes down by 50%. So these are the various uh, things that will be there in detailed rules. Uh, okay, moving on, just a case study. Ship A, it is an EDI ship built in 2016. Main engine power is 7,770 kilowatt. Its reference speed is 14.6 knots. Its achieved EDI value, grams per ton mile, is 4.58. And the required EDI phase two e is 4.98. So 4.5, it's already less than the required. So this vessel has got to do nothing. It need not do anything. It's operate as it is operating today. It complies with the requirement. Ship B is a pre-EDI ship built in 2006. The main engine power is 14,280 kilowatts. Reference speed is 14.7. The achieved EXI, it is the existing ship, so it's EXI, to that calculation is 4.22 grams. And required value is 3.45, so it's a lot less. It has to reduce. So by calculation shows, it has to bring down the MCR to 10,000 kilowatt, 30% reduction. Its speed will drop to 13.02 13 knots. And older ships, speed power curve may show 13.02 knots, but it could be 5% less. So it will be 12.5 or 12.6 knots. So the entire whole fleet speed will mandatorily come down and the Spikes or bounce back you see when the freight market goes up, all speed starts, all ships start speeding up. That will not happen. So I have finished with the XI, move on to CII and ship energy efficiency management plan. So what is CII? CII is the actual, what EXI is the technical efficiency, has to do with technical feature of the ship. CII is operational efficiency, what happens, actual reality. I mean, the grams of fuel consumed in a calendar year, how much distance it has moved actually, and what's the emission per unit cargo work. So there are various units available, metrics, annual efficiency ratio, AER, distance, time, which one will be used for which ship type, it will be decided from now at June next year. Nobody knows, but we have a generally good idea that a annual efficiency ratio will be used for the ships which carry cargo. Ships which do not carry cargo, probably it will be per nautical mile, per hour, uh, or something like that. Those industry association has to highlight or uh, tell us which is right for them. Just to give you an idea, that for the entire shipping industry in 2008, the AER value was 7.4. It has been established through a study by IMO. This figure has to be reduced by 40% and bring it to 4.44. For the world shipping has to reach this particular target. Now, how this will happen in 2008, whatever the value was, so for every ship type and ship size range, different CII values will be established based on what it was in 2008 and what it is in 2019, because 2019 is an important year. From this year, all ships above 5,000 GT are required to submit their annual fuel and consumption, annual distance sale, and annual sailing hours to IMO, reviewed by flag state. And IMO has got all these data. So they will be using this data to draw a reference line that for various ship type and ship sizes, how much CO2 emission per unit transport work. So that will be, that's from 2019, it will be projected to 2023, and then 2030, what has to be achieved. So 
this value in 2008 and 2019 will give us what we have to achieve in 2030. And then this dotted line is the actual line which has to be, but ships cannot operate within a particular CO2 emission intensity. There are bad weather days, long ballast passages, long anchorage stay, there are fluctuations. So that is recognized. So a band has been put, plus minus 10%, 15%. We don't know how wide this band is going to be. So every year, ships have to submit their return with respect to CO2 emission and carbon intensity achieved. And that will be, uh, and a certificate will be issued to that ship saying that you have achieved this. And ships will be rated A, B, C, D, E, based on in which band they fall. And ships rated E in any calendar year, it's, that means it's emitting too much compared to what it is supposed to emit. So it has to give its corrective action to the flag state. If flag state is happy with it, then the ship can continue sailing. And uh, it has to corrective action means how is the ship is going to come down to C rating. But it is not a mandatory issue as yet. Because the because we still don't know what these bands are, so no rules can be made. So until 2026, it is going to remain like this. And in 2026, by when the lot of by June next year, we will have all these figures, and then we will be in better position to see how the CII is working. Because today we have as owners, we have no control over the ship. If it is on time charter, it all depends on how the charterer operates the ship. The ships which are in B band, they are superior, and A are the best, most efficient ships. So these, so the rule is saying ships falling under A and B category, ports and other stakeholders should give them incentive and ships in the E rating for a year has to give corrective action. D rating for three years, they have to give a corrective action to the flag state that how they are going to bring down their uh, rating to C. So ship energy efficiency management plan has to be amended to reflect that how the ship is going to achieve the CII required of the ship over next three years, because this will happen calendar year to calendar year, 23, 24, 25, and 30 onwards. In 2026, there will be a review. By 1st January 2026, this review has to be completed. So we guess whole of 2025, the review will happen, that how is the world ship positioned in meeting 2030 goal? If it is found everything is fine, then no more new rules. But if it is found it is not going the way it is expected, there will be much more stronger rules like asking for further EXI or other rules, punitive measures, etc. But we expect in the industry and who have been involved in this that once we do EXI, the CII rating of the entire world fleet will drop. And Japan has done calculation. They say that it will see us through until 2030. But we have to see in reality whether this happens because these are all theoretical calculations. So this is how it is go down over the years and years. OK, so how can CII by control? I just explained to you, we have no control over this. This is something new. So we are getting into an uncharted territory, how this will be reflected in the charter party. We only have to see as it unfolds, we will realize, and then we will be behaving in that particular way. Review clause, I have explained. Now, way forward. So what do the ship owners do? So await finalization and approval of guidelines related to EXI and CII. And this will be approved in MEPC 76, which will happen in June 2021. So once you have the approved guidelines, et cetera, how to calculate EXI and how to do the survey of EXI, then develop EXI technical file for vessels and get them approved by flag. Some flag may give the work to RO, so it has to be approved by flag state. Prepare vessels for EXI certification by first annual intermediate or renewal service falling due after 1st January, 2023. Prepare vessels means discussion with your governor maker, engine makers, class, et cetera, and to limit to the trial and final certification during that time. 
amend ship energy efficiency management plan prior to 1st January 2023 as per the guidelines to be developed by MEPC incorporating how the required CII would be achieved over the next three calendar years. So this is in essence, in a nutshell, CII and EXI. Now just going over quickly one slide that what has been the advancement of EEDI, as I said in my first or second slide that EEDI phase three starts in 2025, but it has been found that it is technically feasible for certain ship types to advance the phase three. So it has been advanced to phase three has been advised for certain ship type like larger gas carriers in this range, 15,000 and above, to 1st April 2022. This was supposed to be 1st January 2022, but because of COVID-19, the meeting got shifted and that's why this delayed date. So is it advanced for container ships, LNG carriers, general cargo ship, cruise passenger ships, and the reduction factors have been more stringent for container ships. Like in one slide, we saw 50%, 40%, et cetera. So thank you very much. I hope, Mr. Rizab, I have met your, I, I don't know where my timeline has gone. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Mr. Bose, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, as always, you have been very informative. And I know only I feel sorry for the stakeholder and shipping what is going to be challenges because you're going to have annual efficiency and carbon intensity also to be monitored. So these are going to be real challenges. So thank you so much for your presentation. I am always a little concerned that in all these our webinars, we are always having little less time and there's so much to learn and discuss and know and what actually is transpiring at IMO and elsewhere. So thank you so much, Mr. Bose again. And uh, my next uh, panelist, what I'm going to call is Mr. Mishra. He, he is the uh, 89 password from DMT and serving nine pirates from 1998. Currently as Vice President and Head of Operations. So we can like of Mr. Mishra. For last many years, he was posted in London and he too has been a very regular at the IMO meeting. Mr. Mishra, I will cut short your uh, uh, assignment today, and I will limit only to ballast water management amendment with a uh, uh, question to you that though this uh, convention came in 2004 and entered into 8th of September 2017, how is it is we continue to keep getting amendments and new challenges or new modifications every time? I will also like to deal in a very brief that AFS convention also has come out with some amendments. So just give us a brief that what actually transpired. Mr. Mishra, please. Okay, thank you, uh, moderator, Mr. Rai. And good day to all distinguished colleagues and friends. Uh, and I would also like to thank Institute of Marine Engineers India and basically DG Shipping for giving this opportunity. Uh, as MEPC 75 mainly has dealt with short-term measures and which has been fully covered by um, Sir Ayan Bosch, sir. As far as ballast water management convention is there, if you look at it, there has been basically three main topics uh, which has been basically approved and agreed this time. Uh, the first, if you see, it was commissioning test. Commissioning test, basically ballast water uh, by BWM2 Circular 70 Revision 1. This was further revised and approved and commissioning test is required during annual, sur during initial survey, during commissioning of ballast water management system. And it also required during additional survey, if anywhere retrofit is happening of ballast water management system. So this guideline BWM2 Circular 70 and Revision 1 has to be followed for that. And commissioning test is basically to see, to validate the installation uh, ballast water management system by demonstrating that it meets all mechanical, physical, chemical, and biological processes, and it is working properly. As far as uh, uh, second guideline, which has been again further revised and agreed and approved is ballast water management to circular 42, it revision two. And 
this day basically with the experience building phase whatever new details have come with that this has been again uh, revised and revision 2 has been basically approved this time and this can be used for any sampling and even for psc sampling also as far as if you look at the balas water management certificate balas water management certificate has been amended and that will come in force in first june 2022 and if earlier like provisions were given for balas water management methods options like d1 which was balas water exchange option d2 which was basically for fitment of balas water management system and d4 was basically for prototype balas water treatment technology however it has been seen that there are some other alternative approaches are there through which basically balas water management system uh, uh, compliance can be achieved convention compliance can be achieved so for this if you look at it the new checkbox method has been introduced that is one is for b3.6 and this b3.6 is basically balas water discharge to reception facility and the, the second uh, checkbox has been introduced that is b3.7 and b3.7 is for other methods of balas water management and provided that, that these kind of methods when they are adopted on ship they should meet basically same level of protection to environment and, and human health and property as of the d2 uh, compliance and this has to be basically approved in principle by mepc as far as afs is there you know lot of basically discussion etc has been happening to prohibit so uh, basically cyber train and even ppr7 has worked on this actually if you look at it the formula of cyber train it is c11 h19 and 5s and basically it is considered to be very hazardous for aquatic life and it has very long lasting effect on the aquatic life and even this is hazardous even to ozone layer so during mepc they have approved basically draft amendments to annex 1 which deals with the prohibition of cyber crime and annex 4 which is basically deals with afs convention certification as far as annex 1 is there like it prohibits the application of anti fouling paints which is having cyber crime and it prohibits for applying or reapplying this anti fouling <coughs> which contains cyber crime as of First January twenty twenty three, and SIP which have anti fouling system which contains cyber train, they have to so what has been done with basically tin base paint or lead base paint. Similar thing has to be done. Either they have to remove by grid blasting, they have to remove that anti fouling which is having cyber train, or they have to apply a sealer coat. And if you look at the application timeline, uh, this must take place as next scheduled renewal. of anti fouling system after 1st january 2023 and but in no case uh, not later than 60 months after the paint is uh, afs paint has been applied uh, on uh, containing cyber train and as far as annex 4 was also amended and annex 4 basically deals with the basically afs certificate and this afs certificate model that has been basically revised this and section <clears throat> has been revised which basically contains the compliance option and this compliance option has now been updated so that basically it can address the cyber trend and if you look at it, the certification uh, the ship which basically which are not affected by this ban means which are not having anti fouling system which is having cyber trend so they must basically receive their updated anti fouling certificate uh, at their next and next after their next afs application immediately after their next application after 2023 they should able to get the certificate but ship where basically afs has been applied which is basically having cyber train so they, they have to be receiving their certificate not later than 2 years after this amendment has uh, basically uh, come in force so briefly i have covered those two points i Hope I have saved some of your time. Yeah, <laughs> thank okay. you so much, Mr. Thank Mishra. You. Really, thank you, thank so that, uh, you. Because we really want to leave some time for question answers, and I have the same request to Mr. Kashyap, our last panelist for the day. 
and uh, I would definitely like to mention that Mr. Kashyap has the honor to be representing the Institute of Marine Engineers in the delegation to MEPC. So that's a great honor to Mr. Kashyap. He's a mechanical engineer and uh, having worked in Bureau Veritas, currently he's with Sunmar Shipping as Executive Director of Operations. So Mr. Kashyap, we request you also to run through, be brief on the IMO GHG study, which has been approved this time, but I would like you to take more in detail about the adoption of short-term measures. Well, there are some questions already raised about uh, what is being done on the existing ships. And since you are looking after operation of ships yourself in your company, what short measures as a Sunmar shipping has adopted and how you look at that we can attain the required goals. Kashya, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rai. Uh, it's really a pleasure that I've been asked to speak on this uh, occasion, and I would like to thank IMEI for this. This is the first time I'm speaking for IMEI Mumbai. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Completely audible. Yes. Okay, thank you, because uh, I'm speaking directly into the computer. Okay. So, uh, like you said, I will... Uh, I will just uh, touch upon a few points which uh, with Mr. Bose and Mr. Uh, Sukumaran and Mr. Uh, Mishra already identifying the various regulations that have come into play. Uh, what type of a control mechanism was put in place or what type of a control which has been attempted for before these regulations come in were uh, something to do with impact assessments and greenhouse gases. Uh, uh, the fourth greenhouse gas study. So I just prepared two slides. I won't, I won't go into the details of the slides, but I'll just try to share to you so that uh, at any given time, you people might be able to ask questions based on what you can uh, see on that. Would that be okay? Were you, are you able to see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Make it a full slide, sir. Yeah, I made it a full slide. Is it, it is it coming full slide? Yes, sir. It's okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like uh, when, when IMO has actually adopted the IMO initial strategy to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, MEPC 74 came out with a number of measures, some number of papers proposing short-term measures, uh, which uh, immediately asked for a reduction by way of both uh, various materials like technical uh, technical uh, measures and operational measures to be put in place and also identified that uh, these should be you know brought in a fast a little faster because of the seriousness of the environmental thing at which time there was a lot of uh, concerns that this would adversely impact the uh, developing states, developing countries, and the small and small island countries and uh, develop, uh, least developed countries, which would get adversely impacted by any measures that are unilaterally taken by the developed countries. Recognizing this, MEPC 74 said that we should have an in initial impact assessment done using an expertise from UNCTAD, that is the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development to see if the impact assessment submitted in the papers was sufficient enough to cover the actual attention of developed countries and also to check whether they were robust enough to actually uh, clearly propagate or identify how well the uh, impacts are being mitigated. So the expert review took place between 74 and 75 and before MEPC 75, we had the intersessional working group ISWG 7, where the comprehensive uh, uh, impact assessment identified that it, it was uh, falling short of the expectations. Also, the procedure for impact assessments identified that if the initial impact assessment identified a shortage or falling short, then we should go for a comprehensive assessment. So as expected, the, there was a uh, near unanimous opinion that a comprehensive impact, impact assessment was needed. 
and that should be taken. But then with the so much of a hue and cry going on that we need to identify short term measures on a very, very urgent basis to bring down measure emissions. Uh, MEPC said that these two will, will be carried out parallelly for submission at MEPC 76. At which time they also identified that a steering committee should be formed so that they can use member states from developing countries, I mean representation from developing countries, SIDS, LDCs, and uh, start the work on identifying what would be a comprehensive impact assessment using the services of UNCTAD again, who have been uh, closely involved in the initial uh, expert review. Uh, what they also identified that if they have put this uh, impact assessment in place by 76, it would also give sufficient time for us to tweak any of these short term measures which we are trying to implement in 2023 and uh, fine tune them so that uh, the, we can slightly mitigate any adverse impact. That was what was uh, on the impact assessment, which was like a control mechanism on the regulations that are being brought in. And the next thing that actually came in uh, with uh, Mr. Sukumaran was saying that if you look at it in a, in a bird's eye view, the IMO GHG study uh, for a certain sector of uh, countries identified that there was a very concerning factor. And for certain sectors of con uh, countries, we found a lot of positivity in it. So I will try to put the five points which I found very positive, which, which should give us some heart to say that our short-term measures, which we are trying to implement from 2023 are in the right way. One is that we saw that the greenhouse gases as a whole, that is carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide has actually increased by 9.6%, which uh, between 2012 and 2018. But if you look at only the CO2 emissions, if you see in table one, between 2012 and 2018, it has increased by from 2.76 to 2.89, like Mr. Sukman had already showed it, it is a marginal increase. And when they use the voyage-based calculations, now voyage-based calculations is the CO2 emitted irrespective of the type of the ship for a particular voyage between two ports. Before, as compared to the IMO GHG study three, which used a vessel-based thing, that is emissions based on type of vessel we found that there was a 5.6% uh, increase, but it was lower than the total shipping emissions, which is continuous, which is near, which has been nearly constant over a period that is around 2%, which seemed to be a, a very, uh, you know, attractive or a encouraging uh, uh, metric. When you look at the actual uh, positive metric of the IMO fourth uh, GHG study was that the carbon intensity across the shipping has reduced quite a bit. Like uh, the metrics which they have used were AERs and EOI, that is the annual efficiency ratio and the energy efficiency operating index. Both of you showed substantial reductions. I've used, as you see in table two, the last two columns which I have highlighted are clearly identifying that there was at least a 21 to 30 percent reduction in the uh, carbon intensity. So all is not so bad as it looks. So let's look at the positives of the fourth IMO study. There has been an increase in emissions during the period of study, but there was definitely a decoupling between the emissions and the international increase in marine trade volumes. Because between 2008 and 2018, there has been a lot of increase in trade volumes, whereas the expected emissions has definitely not been such. So that is a very positive sign. This is very encouraging because it indicates that whatever measures we have taken till now, that is, uh, you know, uh, seem voluntary movements and, uh, you know, targeting a, a little uh, better uh, planning and other things which we have impl implemented and seem have shown some positive effects along with the bunker prices which brought down speeds and things like that, we have been able to keep the emissions lower in spite of the increase in volume trade. So this only encourages us that the present long-term measures which have been approved uh, in uh, MEPC 75 will definitely provide further emission reductions. 
Now, the study, if you go into a little more detail, had compared three periods, a period 1990 to 2008, where it showed that the emission growth was in sync with the growth in seaborne trade. And that means they were directly coupled, that with an increase in uh, seaborne trade, there was an increase in emission. But what was encouraging was between 2018 and two, 2008 and 2014, the emissions, in spite of the growth, indicated that there was a drop. So this is very, very encouraging because it shows that even in spite of the uh, growing uh, sea trade, the emissions have dropped. That is a clear indication that they are now, now independent of each other. <coughs> Having said that, in 2014 and 2018, between 2014 and 18, they found that that improvement, the rate of improvement was slightly lower. So this clearly gives us a way forward saying that we now need mandated, mandatory short-term measures because till now we were doing it all on a voluntary basis or based on bunker fuel costs or based on time available for the voyage and all that. So instead of that, we are trying to <coughs> put in short-term measures of mandated short-term measures so that we will definitely achieve the requirements as stipulated by 2030. So, Another thing which came out of the decoupling of the trade was that the increased installed power and the fuel consumptions against the general trade pattern continue, continued on reduction in operating speeds, by operating speeds. That is clearly showing that speed was a key driver for control of emissions. This is one of the reasons why limiting speed engine power has taken up <coughs> the technical expertise for EXI. Taking 2008 as reference, if you see, then we have an overall EOI and AER reduction in bulk areas, something to the range of 31%. So if you look at the 40% target, which is achievable, which is required to be achieved by 2030, I think bulk areas may not be taxed too much with the implementation of EXI, but definitely there will be an impact, which we will have to weather by way of lowering speeds. Similarly, like uh, in oil tankers, we will definitely look for an reduction of nearly 20% of reduction of speed. But, but it is uh, not going to just straight away take the ships off the trade, but will only have put us at a slight disadvantage, which <coughs> I think we can weather on till 2026, by which time we will know where do we stand. There was another very uh, important or a very interesting uh, uh, outcome in the report that 87% increase in methane was there during the uh, contribution of methane to the greenhouse gases was there because of increased consumption in LNG and the in involvement of dual dual uh, dual fuel ships. But that does not that does not mean that LNG cannot be an immediate transition fuel. It just means that we need to do further investigation to see how we can reduce the methane slips. The study also identified many, many ways to improve energy efficiency or carbon intensity of shipping and grouped them under four different he headings. One is energy saving technologies, which, which is already there in, uh, in place today, where like in Sunmar shipping, we are using uh, WED ducts, uh, you know, uh, uh, surf bulbs, uh, PBCFs, uh, using better quality hull paints and things like that. Uh, all aimed at uh, ensuring efficiency improves at lower consumptions. Use of renewable energy, which is still uh, um, in the nascent stage, use of alternative fuels that is still not in the making at all. And finally, speed reduction, which is definitely within our control. So based on this IMO for GHG study, MEPC approved the fourth GHG study for publication with many of the delegates uh, appreciating the new <laughs> scientific method by which it was approached. Uh, I just put in a couple of slides saying how is this going to take us further. It would be that we will have an intersectional working group which will uh, go into MEPC, I mean, one week before the MEPC on greenhouse gas, career, greenhouse gas emissions, wherein they will discuss all these guidelines which Mr. Bose was telling us, calculation of EXI, calculation of EEDI, calculation of reference lines, all these things will be identified there and finalized during the intersessional working group and put up for approval in the MEPC. And along with other measures, which we would like to discuss on how we can go forward on the greenhouse gas emissions. 
I think at the same time, we will also have a review of the impact assessment that is going to be carried out for submission to MEPC 76. So this will be a crucial meeting where all the uh, things will be ironed out before it goes to MEPC 76 for approval. MEPC 76 is scheduled 3rd or 4th of June, uh, week of June, and ISWG will be one week preceding that. Uh, these two crucial meetings will be supported by two very important correspondence groups, like uh, Mr. Bose had explained, that we will have a correspondence group on energy efficiency and air pollution, and the other on development of technical guidelines for carbon intensity reduction. In, in addition to that, there will also be a comprehensive impact assessment carried out on possible negative impacts on developing countries and in particular SIDS and LDCs. A focus of this will all be on greenhouse gases and uh, environment. So coming for going forward in the next three, four years, we are in for a lot of regulations, everything specified, specific to uh, energy efficiency and better operating of ships. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kashyap, uh, thank you so much for curtailing your presentation, keeping our time schedule and question answer session also in mind. I would actually like to thank you for uh, dealing with the fourth IMO GLG study, which also took uh, many years to be uh, drafted and then approved. And uh, actually I had asked you, but I think we'll take it in the question answer, that how the sh current ship owners are taking it up to reduce GHG emission on existing ships. There were four or five uh, options which were discussed even at IMO like speed reduction, retrofits, early yes. retirements, or power, etc. Would you like to add a word or two? Be brief, you can give some idea as to what Sunmar Shipping is doing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, what, what actually is uh, the present situation is that the EEXI or the norm which we are expecting is a 20% reduction for existing ships. I mean, meeting the um, requirements of new ships which are going to be built between 2020 and 2024. That means we are talking of ships that have not yet come into or have just come in about eight, 10 years, months ago into operation. So one of the things what we did in uh, Sanmar Shipping is uh, we have identified uh, energy efficiency uh, uh, devices uh, in a, like uh, WED ducts, uh, surf bulbs, and uh, uh, surf bulbs and things like that, which uh, have actually uh, helped us reduce about six, six to seven percent uh, on our fuel consumptions and also helped us. The second thing what we have done is we have uh, upgraded our anti-fouling system and gone about the, uh, attempting the treating the ships uh, with a better, better bottom, flat bottom, a smoother bottom so that she can sail through waters. Uh, in a thing. The third point, what we have done is uh, we have tried to move from normal lighting to LED lightings you know, on all our ships. And uh, we have implemented certain uh, norms in our SIMP, like use as required. But as of now, since we do not know the level of EAXI uh, demand that is going to come to us on what, what are we going to achieve, uh, we have we have been monitoring what is our level of uh, uh, grams per um, ton mile, uh, and we just see what what will be the outcome of the identified uh, EXI, and then we will know what is the gap we have got. Uh, that is what we are doing on our ships as of now, and uh, we hope to be able to achieve it maybe with a little, little reduction of speed. Speed will definitely become a criteria where you will have to bring it down. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kashyap, for taking some more time of yours. And I know we have barged into the question answer session. So before I invite Mr. Girish to take on that uh, session, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the panelists for being so expressive and giving so much of information, which indeed has been very beneficial to all the participants. And we really look forward to the more uh, regulations, rules, or how they are being uh, passed at IMO or discussed, so that the 
load or the burden on the shipping industry and ship owner is minimal while taking due care about the emission aspects we do respect the environmental issues but at the same time shipping has to flourish as mr sukumaran said we are almost over 90% of the trade is by shipping so this is a very vital link of the trade and uh, must be given due credit so with that thank you all my panelists for being uh, very expressive and supportive today we look forward to your participation support in future too so mr girish can you take over the question answer sessions please yes sir thank you uh well uh, since we are already past the uh, you know the time uh, i will uh, pose only one question to each of the panelists the rest of the questions uh, we will answer separately through an email so my first question is to mr uh, ajit uh, i think mr ajit made a very powerful presentation and has raised very valid concerns from india uh, in uh, imo uh, <clears throat> Sir, consider, considering as you rightly mentioned that you know, uh, uh, you know, since this uh, research fund is likely to go through and possibly a sort of a CO two tax regime may come in, so uh, are there any sort of already discussions ongoing with like minded countries, you know, and uh, also any counter proposal going from our side uh, to IMO where uh, you know we could safeguard. Uh, on how this money is spent, and we we get a larger portion of money, and and we get a say on how this, you know, how it can be uh, beneficial to Indian shipping. The greenhouse gas emission uh, issue in total, we have uh, a group of countries. So many other, Mr. Rai, Saab, and all this, we knowing very much. And I think the Mr. Marotra, well, he was also leading the uh, from 63 onwards at least uh, 19. I mean, uh, MEP is 63 onwards. We always we have a great support in our position there, and uh, definitely uh, we will be working more for the MEP is 76 because I even though we could uh, 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 have uh, it stopped at this stage for the time being, it is definitely going to come back. and definitely there is going to be some market based measures there is going to be some levy or something of that sort uh, in coming to uh, uh, either in the form of bunker or maybe in the tonnage whatever form it could be there is going to be some kind of fund generation required or maybe taking place so how effectively the country can utilize such opportunities and both positively uh, in a way uh, see if the fund is there how we can have some kind of improvement in our research and development activities how we can utilize that fund that should be our priority and for that uh, uh, in fact this kind of forum so i we appeal to all all the members particularly the members of the ime and all other industrial uh, uh, stakeholders to come up with the proposals uh before uh, ME, next mepc 76 so that we will have a more considered view particularly we cannot uh, the shipping cannot have a, a view separate from the national policies it has to be aligned with national policies so lot of discussions and deliberations are required definitely it should be for the protection of our uh, 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 country as well as uh, our uh, shipping industry Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> we will definitely take this up, and we will take it up from IMEI side. You know what best we can do. My next question is to Mr. Bose. Uh, actually, uh, there have been a couple of very valid questions that have come up uh, in the chat box. Uh, 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 so uh, the question, I think, uh, Captain Sagi post posted it first. So we are talking about limitation of speed. as a measure to reduce the carbon intensity from the vessels so wouldn't it mean that eventually you know if trade goes up there will be more number of vessels required because the speed has reduced so even though the carbon intensity has gone down will it have an effect on the overall uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, uh, both sir Yes, so so I, I'll just like to clarify. EXI is not a speed limit regulation. It is a regulation on EEXI value, grams per decade nautical mile. So a efficiently designed ship will continue to do the speed as she is doing today. 
Guys, I showed one example. I'm mean, using ETI phase one vessel. It can even earlier build in good designer, good builder, she can continue to do it. So yes, ships which are inefficiently designed, hull profile, etc., they will have a problem and there the speed reduction, speed will remain low. So this is an issue. Yes, I mean, in Japan, we have done very extensive studies of these 33,000 vessels of various ship type sizes. And they have also identified that how many of the ships would require in each ship type above 40% power reduction. So, I mean, it's, uh, and, and they have said that we don't know technical feasibility of that kind of reduction on those ships. So there could be a scrapping of a lot of inefficient ships. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, Captain Sergei, his question is, if the speed comes down, then how will it affect the, yeah, freight market will go up. There's a shortage of ships. So this is, this is the only answer I can give at this moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah understood, sir. Uh, uh, well, uh, my uh, next question uh, is to uh, Mr. Mishra. Uh, it, this is, uh, you know, unrelated. It's a more a politically loaded question, sir, since you are now in London. Uh, what is uh, happening as far as the emission trading scheme is concerned? Uh, uh, and, you know, which you is, seems to be quite, uh, what shall I say, uh, intent on uh, rolling it, uh, rolling out and, and you know, uh, just just uh, feedback from your sides. Uh, see, there is a lot of talk on emission trading scheme and all, and basically you is going ahead with it. But the only thing what I would like to say for our colleagues and patentee members that you must have seen that, uh, I mean, this all regulation with respect to emission, they started rolling out from 1st January 2013. And now, I mean, if you look at it, the June, uh, I mean, for MEPC 76, June 2021, all guidelines will be there. And even correspondence group is starting from Monday, this Monday. So what is required for our, uh, like all our uh, members and others, that they have to now get down to, you know, basically prepare the EXI technical file, you know, because generally EXI is more or less on the EDI concept and the draft guidelines are there. And after June, there will be only one and a half years left. So more focus has to be there to get the e EXI verification, preparing the EXI technical file and the, uh, basically learning the concept of CI, AER, and other things, and improving the shim. And, and even as IRS, we can help in preparing the ESI technical file and other things. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, my last question uh, is to uh, uh, Mr. Kashyap. Uh, uh, <clears throat> now, so far, uh, you know, we have been uh, discussing, you know, from a greenhouse gas emission perspective, whatever has been discussed has been, you know, considering a tank to wake, you know, uh, emission contribution. Is there anything that is being discussed which will sort of look at it from a well to wake uh, perspective also? Or is there anything that's being discussed? And because that will have a even, you know, even bigger impact as far as shipping is concerned. Um, yeah, Mr. Girish, the, the couple of things here which have been uh, contentious issues is that shipping as such or ships as such cannot be responsible for well till delivery. So, so I thought from time to way the ideal thing, but there is a concept that the double counting will happen when there is uh, emissions calculated. I mean greenhouse gas uh, <coughs> emissions calculated from well to wake, uh, well to tank. And then again, the same thing will be calculated unless they are offset between the well to tank and then used from tank to, you know, wake. So this, this contentious issue is being under study and there are a lot of uh, uh, views being expressed. We expect a couple of MEPC papers coming in on telling us what is the study, what is the result of such a study that from well to wake and uh, how do how would they avoid double counting of the carbon credits and uh, how can shipping get offset with the double credits. 
So these are things which there's a long way to go on this. So that is why these short-term measures, the next seven, seven years would be, I would say, more focused on uh, short-term measures uh, rather than uh, thinking about what, what the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions which is happening ashore. This is one of the reasons why we vehemently objected that why should shipping pay for a fund that is going to ask for research and development for a shore-based industry when we are the end users. We are, we are, unless there is a development ashore and unless there are equipment and machines capable of burning alternate fuels, ships will not be able to buy them. So we should make it a shore-based uh, development strategy rather than using ships to fund them and then again buying it from them. So it seemed a bit cockeyed. Uh, sorry for that language, but it seemed a bit, uh, you know, putting the horse, horse before, uh, cart before the horse when we think about development fund, research and development. And like everybody said, or Mr. Ajit Suman also clearly, I don't think IMO has the expertise to actually dish out such a fund. So when you come back to what you asked me, I think we cannot expand our expertise into trying to identify well to wake. I think we should limit it to tank to wake. But having said that, when we uh, look at the broader picture of greenhouse gas emissions, I think we should take the entire scenario right from well to wake to see how much shipping should contribute. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, there yeah, are questions. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Grish, one, one, small, yes, one minute. Yes, see, sir. there are a lot of uh, uh, messages coming to me personally also. Yeah. Saying that how we can stop this kind of excessive uh, regulations. See, the uh, it is a general sentiment. You can say that it is an emotional uh, thing which is going on in the in the community. But uh, to be honest and frank and pragmatic, the IMO regulations are going to be more and more in the coming years. So, and shipping, there is no getaway from that because the environmental pressure on uh, the shipping also is uh, tremendous, like any other industries. Perhaps their impact is maybe more on uh, short-term uh, measures in uh, shipping. But the only way for a country to progress in the shipping is to move ahead of the regulations. We expect that IMRB is going to be, despite of all our reservations, we reserve, all our reservations against the Ballast Water Convention, against the greenhouse gas, expect that this is going to come. So with that perception in mind, it may be tomorrow or it may be after tomorrow, but prepare ourselves for that. If the research and development fund is going to come, how to enhance our research and development capabilities and capacity building is possible in our stage. That is the only way out we can uh, make use of it. The make use of uh, the, the disadvantages into our opportunities. That is the only way out. There is no getaway from the regulation. It is going to be more and more in the coming days, particularly in the environment front. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I fully agree with you, and uh, and I do hope that IMEA would basically we will we will definitely work with uh, you know DGS towards this and co towards contributing to its uh, a sort of a proposal that sort of uh, ensures that the Indian shipping industry uh, and research in India gets a boost. Uh, well, uh, I will not. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll pass it on to. Mr. Brian Disa, our uh, honorary secretary, to give the vote of thanks. Uh, uh, Brian, sir, please. Sir, uh, just Brian, before you start, I'm starting a poll. And uh, whilst the vote of thanks is going on, I'd request everybody to indicate, I mean, to fill up their poll uh, so that we can have the results for our uh, uh, perusal later. Thank you so much. Brian, all yours. Thank you, VK. Uh, it is my privilege to have been asked to propose this vote of thanks on this occasion of the most appropriate and significant webinar in the recent times. At the onset, I want to thank uh, the IMEI branch and the executive community. Uh, executive committee. I take the opportunity to thank DG Shipping for the continuous assistance and support they have been providing the Institute of Marine Engineers at several forums like this. We are obliged to the DG Shipping for the minute-to-minute -minute encouragement they are giving us for offering guidance and encouraging the IMA at every point of time in organizing such relevant technical seminars. 
the institute has taken various uh, diverse matters at different forums and dg shipping has been at the forefront in steering us and promoting the swedish technical seminars and making it very proactive and adding value to everybody in the industry i especially want to thank our chief guest mr barik the chief surveyor from dg shipping for inaugurating the webinar and providing a brief on the happening at the mepc 75 i extend my hearty gratitude to all the speakers for gracing our crucial and very informative seminar which we had which was very knowledgeable today especially mr ajit kumar sukumaran who was the principal officer at mmd chennai mr ayan bose the advisor with gradient shipping mr mishra vice president of irs and presently based in london and mr kashyap the director from sanmar shipping they have all given us very very important and knowledgeable information that the industry needs to have i take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks to all the guest invitees who have attended the webinar and for their cooperation and endless support it has been a pleasure to host all the participants at one time we had more than 200 participants only on the uh, webinar i don't know how many were on the youtube but it has been really overwhelming and the chat box has been full with lot of questions and this has been one of the most interactive webinars which we have had and i really thank all the participation participants for really actively participating in this webinar we have been fortunate to have eminent persona from the industry providing us insight into all the important regulations and i'm sure the participants have benefited from this at this juncture i want to thank our moderator mr rai who has ever been the moderator for and mentor for all of us all of us in the industry and especially at imea and girish and his technical team and the committee for successfully having planned this webinar without the hard work and dedication this webinar wouldn't have happened i am thankful to the indian administration for rendering us with all the possible encouragement and for organizing the event and all the reverend speakers for their enthusiastic participation finally i thank the chairman the secretary the executive committee members of imei who have greatly helped in organizing this webinar and making it a great success thank you all very much thank you brian uh, just to uh, announce the results of the poll i think uh, there was nobody who felt somehow that this needs improvement there was 91% people who said it was very good and uh, more importantly i think out of uh, 130 odd uh, we had more than 110 people voting uh, somehow a lot of people felt uh, that there should have been more time allotted for this but i i think that's a call we need to take maybe uh, separately and uh, i think that's that's uh, that's just about what uh, regarding the membership status of the imre this is a mandatory question which we always ask and we try and make more people members and in case somebody is not a member here most welcome please do become the member uh, back to you rai sahab uh, for your uh, summarization no no actually i have nothing more to add only would like to convey my thanks and gratitude to all the participants and a special thanks to our panelists who really took lot of efforts in compiling whatever we requested them to and uh, my special thanks to mr sukumaran and mr kashya who joined us from chennai and uh, we look forward to support from all of our branches as well in future that whenever we are doing any technical seminar we'll have a participation from other branches so thanks to all the participants panelists chief guest who has actually left us earlier because of his some urgent requirement at back at home but i will convey our thanks to him separately when i call him next but uh, with this we we'll like to conclude and thanks to you all once again for your participation and encouragement look forward to 
your cooperation and support in future too. Thank you so much, everyone who is here today. Thanks and bye. Thank you, sir. May I request everybody to rise for the national anthem, please?